actually, about um, a week ago, I took a, fortunate enough to take a course uh, called Neuroscience Informed Therapy. And while I was doing the course, uh, there are quite a few things that struck me that uh, could be applied to uh, neuroscience-informed Buddhism. And uh, basically the course was about how the brain functions and those functions affect the way that we feel and interact with the world. Uh, one of the things that they were talking about was um, anger and uh, the importance that that plays uh, in people's lives. So I wanted to focus on anger, and I think it's a, it's a good thing from a Buddhist point of view, uh, because anger, as we know, is one of the three poisons. Uh, anger, greed, and ignorance. And these three poisons in Buddhism are the root of all suffering. So uh, we're kind of going to explore how the brain interacts with anger, and that interacts with our Buddhist practice. Uh, the talk's going to take about 30 minutes. Uh, that's about as short as I could make it. It was two days worth of intensive stuff, so I hope we can distill it down and not be too technical. Uh, basically, it's going to be in four parts. The first part, we're going to explore what the problem is with anger, uh, and then an understanding how it works from a neurological perspective. And then, uh, I think more important is how to deal with it on a personal level, and then how to transform that energy of anger into the energy of awakening. Uh, first, I want to start with like two quick quotes from the Dalai Lama so we can get the Buddhist perspective. Anger destroys our peace of mind and our physical health. We shouldn't welcome it or think of it as natural or as a friend. Then he says, there needs to be an understanding that anger never helps to resolve a problem. And then a quote from the Buddha, you will not be punished for your anger, you will be punished by your anger. Now, in the talk, I'm going to use stress, fear, and anxiety, and anger interchangeably. So give me some little slack with that. But if you want a difference to differentiate them, I'll give you the definitions right now of how I'm going to be using it. Uh, fear is a response to a present danger. Anger is a fight response to fear. Stress is the fear of things going wrong, being wrong, or staying wrong. And anxiety is the response to a perceived or imagined threat of a future danger that can't be located in either time or space. In other words, it's characterized by uncertainty. These responses can be triggered by a threat to either the physical self, which is sometimes useful and important, or a threat to the imagined ego self, not so useful. Okay, so let's take a look at some of the effects of anger in terms of health, uh, increased risk of anxiety, digestive problems, headaches, heart disease, sleep problem, weight gain, stroke, hives, asthma, ulcer, lower back pain, shortened life. Nothing on that list we want. Emotional effects, irritability, depression, apathy, alienation. Behavioral effects, uh, makes one prone to accident, loss of appetite, sex drive, excessive alcohol consumption, and insomnia. These are just a few. Mentally, uh, tends to increase worrying, muddled thinking, impulsiveness, poor judgment. Physically, if think how you feel when you're angry, your heart beats fast, maybe irregular, you breathe fast, your muscles feel weak, you sweat a lot, your stomach churns, your bowels feel loose, uh, you find it hard to concentrate on anything else, you feel dizzy, you feel frozen on the spot, you can't eat, you have hot and cold sweats, you have dry mouth and your muscles... Well, I think I feel that way right now. No, no. <laughs> your muscles get very tense. What do you look like when you're angry? <clears throat> right? Your face gets all red, it's, it's terrible, it's ugly. Socially, misunderstanding and minor grievances get blown out of proportion. People that are angry more often tend to end relationships with people. Uh, even close friends rather than work and resolve problems. If you're angry, people don't like to be around you. Uh, angry people are alienated even from their own families. Uh, they have trouble being effective parents uh, and coworkers and spouses. It leads to all forms of violence, road rage, spousal abuse, child abuse, animal abuse, elder abuse, 
which have all reached epidemic proportions in the United States. Anger is a major contributing factor to genocides, war, civil unrest, terrorism. It costs millions of lives each year and untold damage to the environment and destruction of property and prosperity. Summary, fear, anger, and anxiety all have the same physiology, which we're gonna explore. It's bad for your health, it feels terrible, destroys relationships, cause millions of death and destruction. Not a good thing. Okay, so how does this work in the body? The stress or anger response has three phases, alarm, reaction, and return. We're just gonna explore them briefly. Uh, perhaps you've experienced this, a fire alarm goes off here at work, all of a sudden your, your heart jumps, you, speed, you, get, you get this rush, uh, your, your skin flushes, your, your eyes widen up, and then after you hear it, the brain kicks in and you go, oh, did somebody say there was gonna be a fire drill? And your coworker says, yes, it was 12 o'clock, it's 12 o'clock now, don't pay any attention, and everything goes back to normal. For some people, it doesn't go back to normal, but that's the, the anger or the stress response. Uh, the way that it works in the body, it's trigger, triggered primarily through the senses. Sights and sounds are processed by the thalamus, which is like the switchboard in the brain, and it directs that information to other parts of the brain, to the, to the prefrontal cortex, and particularly the amygdala. That's the one that I want you to remember. You can forget everything else, but keep that in mind. The amygdala is like, at the core of the brain, at the top of the brain stem, and that's the like, emotional, reactive part of the brain that's non-thinking or the reptilian or the ancient brain. Smells and touch, interestingly enough, bypass the thalamus and they go directly to the amygdala. That's why sometimes you'll, have a, you'll you get a smell of something and it'll bring back a memory or you'll have an emotional response to a smell instantly because it just goes direct. It's one of those things. And touch also, which is if you're being attacked or hit, it's, it's a good idea. Uh, any cues that are associated with a threat in the amygdala, whether they're real or not, immediately trigger the stress response, and that happens before you consciously recognize that there's a threat. It's another key point that we'll get to. So boom, the stress response reacts. This is called the reaction phase. Easy, right? What a surprise. In the reaction phase, and I'm going to really simplify this because I had like two pages on it, and I realized my wife said, this is so boring, Cliff, you can't do this. The amygdala sends a message to basically the adrenal cortex, which is the outside of the amygdala gland, uh, adrenal gland, and the adrenal medulla, which is the medulla means middle or center, to release cortisol and adrenaline into the bloodstream. There are actually some 1,200 functions that take place. We'll only go over the first 800. No. So, this is a major simplification, but the result of this is the body's sympathetic nervous system shifts into overdrive, causes the heart to beat faster, blood pressure to rise, lungs to hyperventilate, perspiration, cortisol levels overload the hippocampus so that memories lose, con memories lose context and they become fragmented. The pupils dilate, you experience tunnel vision, adrenaline floods the muscles, preparing them for the fight or flight res response. In other words, you're gonna either fight or run. Protective muscles around the eyes, the throat, the shoulders go up, the stomach tenses, stiffen for protection. Think about it, if you were attacked by a wild animal, it would bite your throat, you would have to protect it instinctively, so you, you clinch up and you tighten those muscles. The eyes, if they get scratched, you can't fight back because you can't see, so the eyes cringe, so you just you see through slits. And the stomach, if it gets clawed or swiped or bitten, well, you're vulnerable there. You don't have any bones around that area, so those muscles have to tighten to protect. So when we're stressed, where do we hold our stress? Strangely enough, in those areas. Okay. Only after the fear response has been activated, as we said before, does the conscious mind kick in. So it's an after effect, the conscious mind. And then it'll decide whether to continue the fear response or not. When triggered as a protective response to the physical body, the stress response is good and essential to our survival. 
it has a very quick trigger, and that it gets triggered quickly, and when it needs to be, is, has been a matter of life and death. It only gets a chance to fail once, and then you're somebody else's lunch. And finally, the third phase is the return phase, which is the shutdown phase. And the interesting about the shutdown phase, uh, in terms of evolution, it wasn't important that the shutdown work as quickly or as robustly as the turn-on phase, because you don't lose your life if you don't shut down. And maybe there's another lion running around or hiding in the bush that you didn't see, so if you're a little, little hypervigilant for a while, uh, there's lions around. So maybe it's not a, a evolutionary a bad thing, but the result of it is it's a manual switch to turn it off, where it's automatic to turn it on, and the connections to it to turn it off are very thin and weak. So uh, we'll talk a little bit more on that in a moment. But let me just summarize it. Most often the fear and anger response is triggered initially by an indefinable something that you sense or think that itself is not threatening, but it's associated with a fearful memory. The on connections are short and thick and automatic. The stress response prepares the body for a fight, flight, or freeze response by activating the sympathetic nervous system. Basically, it's an oversensitive, outdated system. It's easily overwhelmed by a constant stream of alert signals in a barrage of loud horns and sirens, flashing lights, unpredictable movements, particularly in an urban environment. And today, which we didn't have for the last 100 years, a huge influx of signals from the news media, the internet, the graphic violence that we see on television and movies. The mind doesn't know that this isn't something subconsciously that isn't going on in real life. It just takes it in as information, stores that in the amygdala, and all these things are starting to trigger it on a subconscious level and a very subtle level. And this is where uh, stress and anxiety, which is another form of anger, as I said, start to, to come in. Another interesting way that it's triggered is, and I'll read something from uh, Dr. Ron Leifer. He says, among the desires of which we are often unaware is the desire to create a stable, solid sense of self, to feel good about ourselves, to be in control of our lives, when these desires are frustrated, they become a breeding ground for our anger. Anything that threatens or negates our sense of self, which makes us feel bad or anxious or helpless, or interferes with our happiness projects, may unleash the energy of anger, aggression, and violence. And what's our idea of happiness projects? Well, it could be to lose 20 pounds, find my dream partner, buy that house, get a promotion, it's unusual that these themselves are a source of our suffering. It's quite a paradox. So as we can see, one of the things that's so dangerous is the problem of the self. We have a system that's designed to protect the physical body but it gets hijacked easily by a ghost. And that ghost is the illusory self. That's our apparent but imagined identities that we put on like jackets. This is really frightening because this same system designed to protect the body in a life and death situation gets triggered when it's trying to defend numerous and ever-changing roles that we assume with so much vigor and energy as if it was our actual physical body. And sometimes this system will defend this imaginary self with more energy than it will the physical self. But just think how that's possible, all right, and how often we see that. Uh, someone says, I'll gladly give my life for my country. Well, they'll give their physical body up for their imaginary 
self as a patriot, as, a, as a, an American, as a Russian, or whatever it is. So they'll swap that imaginary self for the real self. You have this, uh, I'll sacrifice myself for a cause. You have the example of a suicide bomber. Uh, in Japan, a kamikaze pilot. And even in the, in the United States, in the, in the US Army, or, or, or in many situations where somebody uh, will be a hero and they'll sacrifice their life for their greater identity, or what they consider a greater, which is the identity of that they're part of a squad or, a, or an army or, or, or whatever, and they'll assume that identity. And again, this whole system will key into that. We have only one physical body and there are not that many lines around, but these mental constructions of a self are numerous, they're infinite, they're constant stream that this system is trying to protect, to trying to save. You know, how do you react to threats to your own self-image? With things like, how dare you question my honesty? How dare you question my loyalty? My intentions? Oh, what do you mean you don't think I'm competent? I'm not qualified? I mean, people really take this as a threat to their life. Or you betrayed me. How could you do such a thing? You cheated on me. The anger that arises. And then my favorite is, you know, what do you mean I'm an angry person? <laughs> but anything that we assume as a temporary ego or ideal, this system will take it and hijack it. Animals don't have the problem. That's why zebras don't get ulcers. They're not wandering out on the savanna. Well, I wonder if that, why that lion doesn't like me. I'm just sitting here, and he just really, he, he just, I don't think he likes me. Or they don't sit around and go, gee, I don't think it's fair that all these other zebras are not doing as good a job as watching out as I am. This is really not right. It's unfair. No, the zebra gets attacked by the lion. It runs away. If it survives, it relaxes, goes back to eating grass. Everything's fine. The system kicks in again when the next lion attacks. Until then, the zebra's totally chilled. With us, it gets triggered by an unknowable threat. That's, again, that's some future challenge to the ego, not even an ego challenge that's going on. And it's not shut down. It then becomes, from anger, a chronic and debilitating anxiety, which can be absolutely deadly for the person that's suffering it. So we have an idea of how it works and what the problem is. Good. Two minutes over. So we're going to spend the rest of it on what there is that you can do about it to make a difference in your life, how it relates to Buddhism, and how to transform it into awakening. All right, there's three basic ways psychologically. Is it warm in here? Good. OK. There's three, and everyone can hear me? All right. There's three basic ways that we use to deal with anger. First is anger out. Act it out, scream, yell. Studies show there is absolutely no benefit to acting it out. All you get is more anger. Also, when expressed outward, the recipient has the urge to retaliate with equally harmful resentment, anger, and aggression, thus perpetuating the cycle. The other way, number two out of three, is anger in. Again, not a good solution. When anger is kept inside, people tend to stay in a state of arousal, but they shut down visible emotional responses. They still feel anxious, and this, notice this in emotionally charged situation when there's an argument or another fight or, or they're, they're, they're challenged, they don't show the emotion. Just imagine how frustrating that can be for a spouse or a friend or a family of somebody that undergoes that. Often it's said that anger turned inward is depression. This is a bit of an oversimplification, 
But actually, recent studies have shown that there's a lot of truth up to this point. Ron Leifer explains, this is an interesting point, both anger and depression are the result of frustrated desires or dashed expectations. Both the angry person and the depressed person feel helpless. Anger requires the hope that somehow aggression will yield fruit. When all hope is lost, depression sets in. And it's also a, a key indicator of uh, suicide. OK, so to, to speed it up, we did a top 10. And then I realized I left the most important one off. So top 10 plus one. First one, be patient. In Buddhist teachings, this is the antidote to anger. Patience is still number one on the list. Count to 10. The prefrontal cortex takes the time to send a message to the amygdala that there are no lions attacking. It lets the system cool off. Very important to do. Take three deep breaths. Not only does it give you a pause to think, but the slow respirations tell us, give a, send a signal to the brain, I'm breathing easy. Everything is now OK. You have to trick it to shut down. Pause and notice, number four. Anger tends to have us react to every tiny stimulus. Pause creates a space where you can think. Five, this is an interesting one. Stimulate the vagus nerve. You, some people think, is that, is that kind of some kind of strange uh, exotic uh, sex technique? No. The vagus nerve is very important in this. It runs down both sides of the spinal column and then wraps around your internal organs. By pressing on it manually, it sends a signal back up to the brain that everything is OK and tells the parasympathetic nervous system to send the signals to shut this sympathetic nervous system and all the stuff that we're talking about down. So how do you manually stimulate the vagus nerve? Well, if you listen to the meditation instructions carefully this morning, those are the instructions. By taking a deep diaphragmatic breath down to the lower area, or the Dan Chen, the diaphragm presses down on the organs, and the organs squeeze the vagus nerve, which sends the signal back up to the brain. So thank you. <laughs> um, six. Responsibility, take it and be it. No one can make you angry except for yourself, and no anger is ever justified. We can talk about these at T if you, uh, you know, don't agree. Express yourself constructively, and this is a good tip, that says be assertive, not aggressive. Rehearse your response before delivering it. Here's a quick tip, state how you feel, what's the what in the situation makes you feel that way, and why it upsets you. Don't play the blame game. Keep the conversation focused on your own feelings. Rather than, this is what I usually do, uh, you suck, you lazy piece of ship, 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 OK? Uh, you left your dirty dishes out again. You know it pisses me off. Obviously, you don't care about me at all. There's a, there's a all. And I have had it with you. Doesn't get very far. Or you could phrase it this way, I feel hurt when you don't put your dishes away. It makes me wonder if you care about me or respect me. Would you be willing to talk about it now or later? <laughs> I'm going to write that one down, all right? Another thing you can do, number eight, change your environment. Go for a walk, take a brush of fresh air, turn on the radio. Uh, nine, make Positive statements, let's memorize a few positive statements and repeat them to yourself, like Namu Amitabha. Or you could do, uh, I'd rather be happy than right. This too will pass, mind over matter. If you don't mind, it doesn't matter. Or whatever, you know, you, you, that kind of sticks in your head. Number 10, very, very, very effective, active physical exercise. It's an excellent and proven way to relieve stress by metabolizing. The sympathetic adrenal hormones, those are the chemicals that we talked about, and the waste products of tension. Another great thing is mindful movement. A relaxed body equals a relaxed mind. Try Tai Chi, highly recommended Wan Yoga. 
um, Qigong, or any mindful movement practices has been shown to be very, very effective. And the one I forgot, meditation. Focus on the physical and emotional sensations in the present moment. This is a way to take back control of your brain and place your finger on that manual off switch that you need to throw. Or in technical jargon, switch the brain from what's called the default mode, which is the mind wandering mode, which kind of like saves energy and the brain constantly goes into that. You're daydreaming, you're wondering about things and dinner in the past. That's your mind wandering or your default mode. Switch it to the cognitive control mode, which is your problem solving, your present moment awareness mode. Each time when we're meditating, we remind ourselves to come back to the breath. We're strengthening this part of the brain to be in the cognitive control mode. All right, to recap that quickly, evolution designed our nervous system to turn on automatically with robust connections that are thick and short. It needs to be turned off manually through connections that are weak and distant. Being mindful, that's using the thinking brain to turn the stress response off. There is three ways of expressing anger. Anger in, anger out, but the best is anger control is the way to go. All right. And finally, we get to the last technique where we use this to transform the anger of energy into awakening. The Tibetans have a phrase for it. It's called turning vinegar into honey. I call the technique, let it rain on the flames. Rain on the flames. Rain on the flames. This is the reason I want to say that three times. OK. RAIN is an acronym. And it was originally developed by Michelle Madonna, McDonald, who's a uh, well-known mindfulness teacher out in California. And she designed it as a way to practice um, meditation and self-awareness. Rick Hansen rewrote it to his version. And I took his version, and I rewrote it to be specific for anger. So RAIN, it stands for R, recognize, A, accept, I, investigate, and non-self. Anybody heard of this before? OK. So we're going to go through those, and then we're done. <laughs> OK, recognize is to notice. Sit back and notice that you're aware of something, such as an irritation, the tone of voice used by your partner. Step back into the observation rather than the reaction. Without getting into the story, and let's drop the story, simply name what's present. Annoyance, feeling of warmth on the skin, thoughts of being mistreated, body firing up, pain, clenched jaw, wanting to cry. Whatever comes up, just observe. Come back and ground yourself in the present. Also. Try to recognize the places that anger can hide. It's not always obvious. There's a whole spectrum that it falls on. And I'll give you a couple of words, and you can get the feel for how varied anger can be and how it can hide under different guises. I'm irritated by his behavior. I'm disappointed in her. I'm unhappy about her. I'm frustrated, I'm upset, dismayed, exasperated, discouraged, disillusioned, offended, annoyed, pissed off, displeased, disturbed, I'm just disturbed, I'm not angry, I'm disturbed, resentful, and disgusted. All different words, different forms of anger. Be on the lookout. They work the same way. Next is R A, accept, allow. Radical acceptance. Acknowledge that your experience is what it is, even if it's unpleasant. Be with it without trying to change it. What you resist persists. Try to have self-compassion rather than self-criticism. 
Don't add to the difficulty of being difficulty by being angry that you're angry. I do that. Anger is an internal physical process. It's not an irresistible external force. Accept that there's anger and just let go of what's beyond your control. If it's beyond your control, you can't do anything anyway. You can only change yourself and your responses to others, not what others do to you. I, investigate, inquire. Try to find an attitude of interest and curiosity and openness. It's OK for your inquiry to be guided by a bit of insight into your own history and personality. But more important, try and question your beliefs about the stories and what's actually happening not the tale about what other people are doing and what's right and what's wrong, what's actually going on. There's a Nis Nisreddin story that I uh, tell you. Um, one of Nisreddin's neighbors comes to visit him, and he asks Nisreddin, Nisreddin, can I borrow your donkey? I need it this afternoon. And Nisreddin says, oh, I'm sorry, my donkey's not here. And just as he says that, there's a loud baying in the backyard. And the neighbor says, but Nisreddin, I hear your donkey baying in the back. And Nisreddin says, well, who are you going to believe, me or the donkey? <laughs> the point is, always believe the donkey. Just because you say something to yourself does not mean that it's true. Here are some questions that you can try. Uh, and by hiding anger under a justification. Ask what it is that really needs protecting. Is it the physical self or is it the conceptual self? Is it the anger or the anxiety useful at this moment? Who is protecting who? And then you could just examine the anger itself. Is it hot? Is it cold? Is it subtle, like a limp handshake or a cold look? Or is it hot, off the hook? When it comes to anger, rationalization does not make it rational. And finally, uh, this is probably the most Buddhist of it, is non-identity or non-self. If we let go of that conception of the self, of who we reify and think that we are, that self that does not exist, at least not as we think it does. No self, no problem. And one way to do that is don't identify. Think there is anger arising, not I am angry. Same thing works with sadness. There is sadness. Not I am sad. There is the feeling of anxiety. Not I am an anxious person. Don't identify. These are just fleeting experiences. They're small aspects of the totality that's you. Try and see the flowing nature of sights and sounds and thoughts rising and passing away because for the most part, they have absolutely nothing to do with you. The ultimate cure for anger, violence, and aggression in our own life and in the world is letting go of the attachment to self, in opening our hearts to others. I personally could never express it as clearly and absolutely as beautiful as the great Vietnamese monk Thich Nhat Hanh does. So I'm just going to finish and read a small thing that he wrote. And I hope that we can all take it to heart humbly. When we get angry, we suffer. If you really understand that, you also will be able to understand that when the other person is angry, it means that she is suffering. 
when we see that our suffering and anger are no different from their suffering and anger, we will behave more compassionately. So understanding the other is understanding yourself. And understanding yourself is understanding the other person. Everything must begin with you. Thank you all very much.